Okay, I think we'll just get started and as people join in, they'll join in. Um, we don't have a formal um, agenda for this meeting, it's an informal meeting. And so I think we had left off last time. Um, yes, Jeff, um, did you send them the invitation? I, did. I wanna make sure, yeah, that's why I didn't see him on. Let me send him a link again. Okay. As we talked about at our previous um, in-person meeting, we're going to be trying to set the timetable today for um, those public meetings. Um, and then just basically pick Jeff's brain a little bit about just where we should be starting. So. And Josh Simmons will be joining in a second. Okay. And he's the mapper database cruncher. Perfect. Um, I was busy today, so I did not look this up. Um, what is our new deadline um, for um, submitting. Does anyone know offhand or have? Um, I tend to think it's in May, but I, I didn't. I can look it up. Right. It's either okay. March or May. One one deadline for the commission, and one deadline for the common council to uh, accept it. Right. Um, so I don't know if it makes sense when we're thinking about um, dates and locations and things like that to um, consider kind of like working backwards from that point. Um, but, you know, you're, you're probably more adept at this, Jeff. Um, well, one thing I could do is working backwards, develop a calendar so that you have the date you've got to report the plan by and that way you can sort of uh, plan out from the beginning what needs to get done so that there's enough time in between but part of what you want to discuss with Josh is the data and one thing he's you know good at is to take the the new census data and the current city districts and the current city geography overlay them and just see what works together what doesn't uh, we talked to a very rural county today uh, in the southern tier, and they did everything by hand. It was all not out of alignment between the new census data and their hand-drawn legislative districts. So it, it could take a bit of work, but then again, uh, based on either what you might know or what Josh can find out for you, it could be done rather quickly. Because so essentially you want to take the uh, the current districts and the map and the populations from 2010-11 um, and then overlay the new data so you know exactly which districts are within uh, the you know the five percent standard and dist redistricting is going to be a bit different in New York given the stricter constraints both with charter law with city law and state law that we have to you know figure out what you know about. I think you all know uh, the Governor Hochul signed a bill uh, about two, three weeks ago creating additional criteria. So we have to take the city criteria and then overlay with that the new state criteria to make sure they work you know, in tandem together. Hey everyone, I, I have the new deadlines um, just for our knowledge, um, we have to schedule our public hearings between March 1st, 2022 and May 1st, 2022. Um, the final plan 
needs to be adopted by August 1st, 2022 um, from June 1st. And that's um, after August 1st, that's when the council considers it and gets back to us whether they like it or not. Jeff, um, could you give us in a nutshell what those additional criteria are that the that the governor said, if you could do it in you know a minute? Sure, actually, I had the screen open. Let me just uh, move my curse. Okay, uh, the first one is, let's see, uh, that the overall population difference from the smallest to the largest district has to be within 5%. That, and then the second criteria is that uh, districts shall not be drawn with the intent or result of denying or abridging the equal opportunity of racial or language minority groups to participate in the political process or to elect candidates. Uh, the third criteria is that districts shall consist of contiguous territory. Uh, fourth, districts shall be in compact form as is practicable, which means very compact. Uh, and then districts, then this sort of a kitchen sink final criteria, uh, districts shall not be drawn to discourage competition or for the purpose of favoring or disfavoring incumbents or other particular candidates or political parties. Also, the maintenance of cores of existing districts or pre-existing political subdivision divisions including cities, villages, and towns, and of communities of interest shall also be considered. So um, uh, there, uh, communities of interest would be the last rank criteria because you know, Syracuse is a city, so we don't have towns or villages to deal with or counties. And these are also rank criteria so that you know, the population equality, minority voting rights, contiguity, compactness, and community of interest in that order are the state mandates that every locality in New York has to uh, uh, comply with. And when you look at the criteria now, uh, I'm not the expert on Onondaga County legislative redistricting, but a question uh, you know, is coming up, how do you define like what the minority voting interests are? And that's something I guess the county legislature is taking up this week. And from what I've seen, there's been some misguided information, uh, I think in the legislature about whether you can or can't create minority districts. That's different re redistricting process, but uh, we haven't gotten anywhere near the point yet of discussing that for the city council, for the, for the common council. Just, just one quick question. The first criteria you mentioned, um, the, the difference of 5% between the highest and lowest. So it's not 5% from the median, it's 5% between the highest and the lowest. Right. So okay. you can go two and a half, two and a half, four, one. Understood, yes. And John, I was frantically searching for a writing utensil. Can you just like say again with these meetings, the March through May, is that for like all public meetings or is that just like the first, that has to be just, that's all of them, not just the first round, right? Muted, John. Oh. Yeah. You're just on mute, John. I'm here. I can mute you. I'm sorry, which is good because I was kind of stammering. Um, I believe we have until we have from March 1st of this year till May 1st of this year to have all of our public meetings um, in which we'll come up with a plan. And then post May 1st, we would have our two 
one north of 690, one south of 690 meetings to present our maps. Um, and then August 1st is when we would submit them to the council for their approval. And then, you know, whether they approve them or not, we could lead into further meetings and courts and all that good stuff. What is the reason we can't meet, have a meeting in January or February? I, didn't um, know. I don't know. I mean, I. The initial, yeah. the initial criteria didn't say anything about being such such limited time, because aren't, aren't there two meetings in each district besides the other two? You're talking about eight meetings in eight weeks. I think the and we have had first drafts in there too. Yeah, I think the commission can hold organizational sessions, uh, you know, develop outreach you know, programming uh, before March. By the way, uh, uh, Josh is on the call now, so you might want to have him introduce himself since I've introduced myself at the last meeting. Um, just want to let you know that Josh Simmons is on. Hi. Yeah, Josh Simons, Benjamin Center. I apologize for my tardiness. I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old downstairs wreaking havoc right now. So if you hear any smoke alarms go on for anything like that, don't worry about it. I'm here. It's probably just something else. <laughs> Josh, this is but why don't you just let them run the meeting? I mean, I'm, you know. <laughs> you want me to? I'll call them in. I mean, they're not shy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if I could suggest, we, we don't have a contract yet, and I haven't received anything from the city, but uh, perhaps Josh can talk about some of the initial kinds of data analyses that ought to be done. These are the things that once we have a contract, we'll you know, really spell out there, but these were included in our proposal. Yeah, so for me, the, the first step is the, the de population deviation and demographics report. And basically, it's just to take the existing um, the existing uh, wards and uh, their wards in Syracuse, right? I just want to make sure I have my, my terminology right. Yeah, so yeah. Take, the exist take the existing wards, lay out the boundaries, pull in the prisoner adjusted uh, population data. Uh, for 2020 and see uh, what the population and the demographics of uh, each one of the wards are, which will give you a deviation percentage to see basically how much things have to change um, with the existing map and kind of what the what the demographics of the city look like. Um, and from there, I think like a first decision would be, it, does the commission wanna modify the existing boundaries or draw a map from scratch? Or do they have to take into consideration the, the existing boundaries, Jeff? I'd have to look. Uh, well, the, the state law allows that. I'll have to you know, take a look at the city criteria. But um, part of that also might be what we want to hear from public hearings, that what, what does the public want? You know, the, the state criteria suggested, suggests, without being prioritized, that the cores of existing districts you know, be considered, but, the, but they're not prioritized at all. So. Uh, yeah, at the state level, uh, the commission there has kept an open door to any kind of an idea. So some people may come in and say, say you know, we don't want to deal with incumbency at all. I think that's part of what the, you know, the, the listening tour type hearings, but we'll have a better idea once we put out the, you know, the overlay so people can see whether their current districts are over or under the, um, you know, the, the necessary population level. Jeff, this is but I have a question. So um, we know that um, 81 is going to impact not only the south side, but parts of the west side as well. Um, and so do how do we take that into consideration? Um, because what I found that I actually went on the HUD website and looked and I, I thought that the um, they had to rebuild the same number of housing units as they currently have to house the same number of families. What I found out is that HUD doesn't have to do that. They only have to offer um, housing vouchers for the, the same number of families that they're housing now. So those families could leave the area, they could, you know, whatever. 
That's a that's a very unique and good question because it it really hasn't come up in places. Uh, just give me a sense, if you could, I uh, have a basic understanding that there'll be a lot of housing changes that populations that are there now will be vacant for a while and relocated. But with redistricting, you look, you, you, you draw the lines based on the census data as it was reported by the Census Bureau and as can be you know, under or overpopulated uh, within the law, within like the 5%. But uh, I've never seen a situation where we know there's going to be a housing development that's let's say going to have 500 people in two years. Um, the, the law doesn't really permit you to uh, project out to create a district where people aren't actually there now. We use the federal census data, you know, as the um, as the real data. It could be adjusted, uh, but it's got to be adjusted in a way like prisoner reallocation is one way that uniformly uh, adjusts data uh, across the state. So the city population will, I'm just guessing, will increase a little bit based on the reallocated prisoners uh, located from rural prison areas back into cities. Uh, but you know, I've never seen putting people in who are vacating and then moving in later. That could right. be risky to try to do that, but we're not there yet. Yeah, and I don't, um, and I'm not suggesting that we do, I was just wondering how do we account for that because the other thing is when 81 comes down and they do the rebuilding, it's gonna be, um, it's gonna be mixed use. So it's just gonna be some, um, there's gonna be also some market rate housing as well. Yeah, so that's we gonna change the economic um, demographic of that particular area. But it's interesting that you should say the prison relocation because CCA actually has a large, well not large, but they have a pretty um, sizable housing um, piece over there right on Oak and I can't think of the, I think it's Montgomery um, where they house um, relocated prisoners. Well, when I say relocated prisoners, uh, the state has a law that relocates, well, the Census Bureau counts all prisoners at the prisons where they are incarcerated. So let's say whether you're in Clinton County or, or Erie County at Attica or um, whichever prisons, the Census Bureau counts the inmates where they are incarcerated. What New York State has done is uh, enacted a state law that takes the prisoners and reallocates them from their prison location back to their homes of record prior to incarceration. Mm -hmm. So anybody who you know, is incarcerated now, whose home was in Syracuse prior to leaving Onondaga County and going to prison, they are put back in the census block where they, were, uh, where they would have lived. What they don't do is take a re, you know, reallocated prisoners who were in a prison and move them now into you know, a, a rehabilitation facility, whatever you call it. So it's a little bit different. Jeff, um, just in response to Babette's comment, I, I don't think the prison analogy holds. A previous speaker was talking about the, um, the population movement uh, that we might uh, project regarding 81, and there was never an intention to somehow overcome the 5% um, guideline in, in order to uh, predict where people were. The advice, and someone might help if I misinterpreted that, was to make changes at the margin if you think that a particular district will gain population or will lose population, predominantly gain population, to in include that, that gain but not necessarily run up against the the five percent um, criterion. Yep. So uh, that, that we're, we're talking about changes at the margin here, not necessarily. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I've often advised that if you are pretty certain there was a census undercount of population, then, then you could underpopulate the district to uh, make up for the alleged difference. I think what you're saying is somewhat similar that uh, you're giving a, a rational um, explanation, but you're staying within legal limits. 
And also when you draw districts, you don't always have to justify district by district exactly why a district is 1% over or 1% under. It's good, it's good to do that, but you wouldn't be held liable if you don't. And so, so Joshua, you will, um, cause you're gonna be working on the data piece. So you'll have that, that information around the prisoners that will be um, allocated or, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I have the overall data set. So those are that's the numbers that I'll be working off of. Um, and uh, down to like an individual prisoner level, they don't, you know, they don't basically what they do is they take the census data, then they they take the uh, Department of Corrections database and they they create a, a third data set out of the two. Um, so like, yes, the, long, the short answer is yes, I'll, I have the prisoner adjusted population data and that's that's what I'll be working on. Yeah, that data comes from the State Department of Corrections. They provide that data to the state legislature's uh, task force on demographic research and reapportionment called LAT4. Uh, LAT4 spent the better part of um, the summer this past year checking every prisoner's uh, address. For prisoners who had a, uh, a, a previous address prior to incarceration, uh, they were reallocated not by name but by by race and ethnicity uh, to the census block where their home was located so they're not put into 123 main street they're put into census block 123 uh, and prisoners who did not have addresses that were identifiable were simply dropped from the state redistricting data and that data was posted to the state legislature's website downloadable for anybody to work with and that's where josh got the data thank you speaking of data jeff you were you mentioned this other community that had more or less hand-drawn lines josh can google this as easily as i can but just to say uh the the city of syracuse has downloadable shape files for all of our wards and things so that won't be a problem in this case excellent I just mentioned how we have to also make sure that the data lines up the right way, that the election districts, the census data, everything works out. And I mentioned you know, some counties did their redistricting by hand with meets and bounds. And uh, this isn't always matchable to census data if you split census geography. But since you have the shape files, that's a lot easier than um, you know, looking at what somebody wrote down on paper. Uh, since we have a moment, um, I reached out to Tony Tolbert last week. Uh, Tony's retired from the school district. Um, it makes sense to me that a lot of our public meetings should probably be held in schools because there's a lot of schools in every district. Um, Tony's, like I said, is retired from the school district. He knows the superintendent has a pretty good relationship with him. I know some of you on our commission also may know the superintendent or at least have a relationship with the district. Um, Tony couldn't be here tonight, but he's he's going to reach out to Superintendent Alisea and um, mm -hmm. get us going to get permissions to use the schools for our... Uh, for our meetings. Um, that involves going through a permit process um, that's run out of central office downtown. So basically um, before Tony reaches out to the superintendent, any of you that have a relationship with the district or the superintendent um, are welcome to sign on to Tony's communication to the superintendent asking for his blessing for us to use school buildings to have our meetings. Yeah. Um, on that note, it's worth just keeping in mind that I've seen a lot of building administrators and schools and libraries very hesitant to want to offer mm -hmm. space given the, you know COVID restrictions and people right. coming yeah. into buildings. So just be mindful of that. Uh, I know I did so I did work in Connecticut for the state legislature there. And some of the towns, they wanted to hold hearings and said, you know, we, we don't want you, but if you're coming, we'll give you two hours from 3 to 5 p.m. And, you know, you can't stay beyond that. 
Uh, even the state commission uh, had a lot of difficulty in locating venues for their hearings. This is the bit. I, I did talk to um, Christian. I'm on the OCPL board and I did talk to the executive director of OCPL and, and that was some of the, he's actually under the county and the county is, is kind of limiting who can use the library buildings right now. Cause I was thinking about those for daytime meetings because not everybody's gonna wanna come to an evening meeting. So we should have a range of times for people cause some people work evenings and nights and wanna come during the day. Um, so, you know, I know we're gonna all be hindered by what's going on with with CDC pandemic guidelines. And um, so right now the, the public library is under, um, under restraints because that's what the county is telling them that, that they couldn't really have public meetings. Yeah, I could today. work with you on this, but it probably is worth talking to the county's uh, uh, video people uh, about uh, having not only in-person hearings, but the ability to also hold part of the hearing via Zoom. Uh, the state hearings were held that way. Uh, I attended several of them where people would testify in person, but then they would also allow people to testify over Zoom. They used some combination of YouTube or um, uh, Facebook video. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm just guessing that the county may have some, I'm sorry, the city may have a video operation where they can you know, uh, weigh in with assistance to do that. And this is Melody Holmes. I just want to put a little bit of input. How's everybody doing this evening? I know. One of the, hi. One of the things that I want to say just listening um, is that um, one of the things that we probably can utilize is churches that are located in, in every area. Mostly every church is, has a Zoom or has some type of social media capabilities now where they are on the internet or they are on Facebook or they are on YouTube or whatever. And so they, we can utilize them and they're already, um, the majority of them anyway that I know of are COVID compliant. So there may be uh, a need to utilize churches in all of the areas, um, Transfiguration on the North side, um, Tucker or, or, or Hops on the South side, you know, there, because I know that the churches have been um, uh, making themselves compliant so they can hold services. It's another avenue we may want to look at. I don't, I have to agree with you as a city school district employee, it's not, it's not good to try to utilize their space. It's not, it's not something that they're looking to do. So between libraries, schools, churches, any kind of civic buildings, um, Kiwanis or Rotary, whatever kind of facilities are there, uh, you know, you want to be looking to see what venues are available in each ward uh, to, uh, you know, to try to scope out or at least put in the radar that between March and May, uh, you'd like to use a facility. Should we be looking at that now? Should we form an ad hoc? This is Melody again. Should we form an ad hoc committee to look at space, to look at location? What well, do you think, Jeff? Mark? It, it, I would suggest it because if you find five venues in one ward, two or three of them may say no. Uh, they may you know, already have policies that are good or bad. Uh, but you don't want to find that you want to hold a hearing March 1st, and we're looking for space February 15th. That would not be good. So I'm going to follow up with that and just put myself out there that I'd be more than willing to work on that to find venues in each ward so that we can at least have that in place and, and publicize that in plenty of time. Yeah, to the extent there are any city offices that keep track of events or do outreach with other, other facilities, uh, you know, it would be worth just seeing what the city can provide as in-kind services. I think we also, didn't Molly, didn't we start a list in the Google Drive with locations? So Melody, I think you can start adding stuff to that list. I do not, I have not seen that list in Google Drive, the bet, but I will search for it, but I have not seen it. Um, so we can go, I, I, I'll follow up. Yes, there is a, um, a folder for like ideas and meetings. Um, I'm not sure that we have, because we haven't really been on this train yet. I don't know how active anyone has been on there with adding ideas, but is there anyone else, this will be an ongoing conversation, Certainly. Is there anyone else aside from Melody that wants to have this be like a niche area that like you are really focusing on about organizing and starting to plan some of these 
public meetings and reserving space, all of that entails. Hi, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going with the school district because um, at the very least, we can get into Fowler, Blodgett, and Seymour because my wife and daughter are teachers there. So, <laughs> um, and their principals love them. Their administrators have already offered. And I don't think that Jaime LSA is going to say no to us if we give them advance notice and allow for uh, a custodian to open the building for us and you know, as long as we promise not to make a mess, I'm sure we're going to have access to some of these schools. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have meetings other places, but I have a, I have a good feeling that we're going to be able to get into at least some schools. So John wants to work on this line as well, Melody and John, anyone else who is interested in um, doing some of these more logistical tasks around um, starting to think about these public meetings. This is Jackie. I'd be willing to, uh, uh, because schools are, that's a good idea. Um, but also just something more, something walkable in our community would be great too. Okay. All right. So, Mel. And please feel free to contact me if you have any kind of, uh, kinds of questions on what the facility should look like, or just you know, any kinds of questions. I've done this a lot of times in the past. Right. There's, there's no expectation that the people attending the meeting or Zooming in, and certainly no way of, of ensuring that they're from the ward, that in effect, all of these meetings are a public meetings open to everyone. Um, it's just the location and the convenience of the location. Right. Yeah. We, what, 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 what we try to do is, is target a hearing to a specific community or district. But at the state level, they held a hearing in Albany and a bunch of people from Brooklyn showed up. <laughs> they, they figured there's more time in Albany than they would have had at the Brooklyn hearing. Also, one thing you also need to be a, a cognizant of is to get a, um, uh, a recording of the hearings and preferably a transcript. And that's something the city might be able to help with. And that the, uh, you, the, the hearings ought to be video recorded uh, on a website so that people can see them later. Are, are you all working on developing a website? Jihan, where are we at with um, our website and all that? Um, we, I reached out to the city, but I haven't heard a response. Um, we just have that temporary website right now. Um, yeah. And the website should also have uh, useful information. It ought to have uh, the um, uh, state law, the city, you know, the city law, uh, I, I can work with you on that, but it should have some user friendly information, uh, some freq frequently asked questions. These are all things that we put in our proposal to help with on outreach and maintain a website. Uh, I think you would, this is Melody again. Did you ask that for a specific reason, uh, Jeff? Did you want us to have it up by a certain date so that we can start feeding it in because I'm looking at our dates. If we're supposed to be having meetings in March and I'm saying well, by the end of January, we should have the website up. And I, I think January is the working month to get a lot of these things lined up. Yeah, Without okay. Being, uh, president of Jeff, um, this is the vet. So do you have some really good information around educating people on, you know, other than the, the FAQs? Because my concern is we want people to, to give input but we want it to be thoughtful. Um, and so do you have anything that we can begin to really educate people on what this, what this is, why this process happens and kind of kind of lay that foundational work for folks? Yeah, that, that would be part of what I, I plan to do. What I, what I learned over the years is that when you just tell people uh, redistricting is important and it's happening next year, you've got to care, you've got to show up, they don't get it. But if you tell somebody, look outside your window, uh, look at the 
streets, the hospitals, the schools, the senior centers, all of the things that are around you, your quality of life is dependent on who represents you in Albany, Washington, and City Hall. And that's why you have to care about redistricting. If you want to make sure that your community gets the resources it needs, better schools, more hospital beds, um, you know, repaired roads, then you have to care and stand up and get involved. Because if you don't, the lines that are drawn next year will be in place for 10 years and there are no second chances. And people then begin to understand why this is important. And so what does your process look like? Well, we basically developed some literature. Uh, I'd also suggest that uh, there be outreach to you know, media, radio and TV stations, newspapers to go out and sell the issue, to uh, uh, do an, an informational session for the press, and then you know, get as many interviews lined up for those of you who feel comfortable in, uh, in talking about this, and doing interviews as to you know, why you uh, volunteered to serve on this commission. Uh, what the commission is all about, what you're going to do, when you're going to do it, and how the public can get engaged. And do you have anything specifically around engaging difficult populations like young people who don't watch the news and read the newspaper? <laughs> well, that's something where we might want to go you know, to the schools and do a presentation or have the schools bring it up that you know, redistricting is happening now. That impacts you know, our, our schools, the quality of our schools, that it's a, it's a civics lesson. Uh, one thing I did at the state level and uh, Syracuse University participated was to have student teams draw model maps that could be replicated at the uh, city level as well. There's a lot of free software instruction and data out there where people can draw maps. So John, as you know, if you when you're talking to Jaime, that might be a nice way to get him to also plug into the to the student and nice pulling for the district. Absolutely. And we would do outreach at the schools to, to you know, hopefully get the parents coming to the meetings. If there are parent teacher association meetings in person or Zoom, get space on, on each of their meetings to uh, do five minutes. Jeff, we're having, um, we had sent out a press release to just like any of the local press and redistricting being such a hot topic these days, especially in our community, you'd think more people would be biting on like, hey, there's another redistricting commission, but like it's been pretty much crickets. And so Jihan is having really a, a tough time getting anyone to, to show any interest in, in what we're doing. So do you have any sage advice for us on this matter? Uh, well, I'd like to see the material that went out to them, but uh, I do like one-on-one -on -one calls. I mean, I, I do this in my work at the state level. I reach out to reporters one-on-one -on -one and I you know, mention to them, you need to be covering this and explain why or go to their editors. I mean, right now, the media is looking at the county legislature and all the politics involved there. I don't know how it'll, how it'll play out yet, but you want to build and whether, not, not saying it's good or bad, but in Syracuse has one of the most unique processes in New York State, a new, a new one. And uh, you know, let, let's make sure that this process works. Um, you know, we'll also know early January if the state commission worked or didn't work. The Syracuse Commission is a little bit different. Uh, it's not made up of, you know, you're not appointed by the political leaders, but you know, we'll be creative about it. I'm gonna give it a lot of thought. Worst comes to worst, you could just put out a draft map that alienates everybody. <laughs> and once every, then once everybody's all riled yeah. up, and ready to like come with the pitchforks, then you can be like, well, at least you got their attention. Maybe that's not a great idea. Yeah. So we could do with the county. Oh, you, I, I want that idea. <laughs> I want to be in charge of the fake map. <laughs> you got it, Jason. All right. Uh, that's just a suggestion. Um, uh, I think uh, when you're talking about Syracuse, um, we're, we're not talking about the radical gerrymandering that's 
that's so obviously unjust in, in much of the country. If, you, if you're trying to reach people that are 18 years old and know nothing about this, they need to know what, what redistricting is from the standpoint of the, of the worst case and they see the injustice of it. Now that might not get them to, to, uh, to our meeting, but as a, as a civic education enterprise, um, it, it would, and again, this is connecting to the civics classes that they might be taking in high school. It might get them to realize the impact of this nationally, albeit not necessarily in the city. I mean, there's a lot of shit going on in the country and you know about it regarding this. Yeah, it is headline news every day in you know, the New York Times, uh, cable news is now, all the networks are covering it. That hadn't happened before. So I think it would be wise, um, you know, we're talking about like the timeline for these public meetings, um, being mindful that there is a lot of the educational outreach that needs to, that can be put in in this time, um, I, you know, before we're, I guess, maybe allowed to have these public meetings, you know, um, doing some of that educational stuff. Um, like Susan Lerner was talking about with some of like her workshops, like with the re um, resources that Jeff has, um, January and February seems like that might be the time to, to do that. So maybe um, Babette has um, suggested maybe making a, a plan for educational outreach. My school. Yeah, my I didn't hear the last uh, about 30 seconds. Okay. Um, we were I just said that um, using January and February as a time to do some of that educational outreach um, might be wise. Um, and so I didn't know if that's something that, you know, sounds good to everyone else or what we should be thinking about in terms of the educational outreach. This is Babette, I'm willing to work on that. I'd like to work on that as well. Um, contact, contact the high schools and, and see um, what they might think is a, is a good way to, to get at the, uh, at the young voters um, that, are, um, that we need to get to. Perfect. Babette and Bruce, you guys will text or email or do whatever your little subcommittee um, deems necessary. Um, anyone else who wants to join in, you know who to go to. Um, in terms of the um, press stuff, Jeff, Jeff we were um, discussing this at our last meeting. Not that we've had many requests for, you know, like interviews and, you know, all these kinds of things. Um, we were discussing, should there be like a spokesperson or a set of spokespeople or should like, you know, should everyone kind of have like a loose script or idea and they deliver it in their own way? Um, so this has been the conversation. Um, what should we do when the time comes that like we really need to promote this or someone gets approached to do something? Um, so we were also going to have that conversation today and I'm very interested to see what, because you've been doing this. Oh, well, so to be what consistent, you think is best. Uh, yeah, the chair, the commission chair ought to really take that lead. Mm -hmm. And um, do you have, have you created officers yet or any kind of a structure? Yes. Uh, well, the structure that we have is that John and I are both, um, I like to say co chairs. So um, that's all that we really have. We have these very informal subcommittees but like we really haven't been able to do much um so even like we're yeah we have no real structure other well, than these i think each of you that wants to talk to the press or to maybe you know put together a list of whether you have press contacts or specialty areas that uh, you can reach out to 
But outside of that, you know, John and Molly, you should probably take the leads to uh, try to get on uh, interview shows, get columns done. I know, uh, it, you know, the Syracuse paper, uh, Michelle, I think it's Bright Batch, I'm not sure if I have her name right, uh, Bright Batcher or something close to that. And Tim Knaus have been following uh, Onondaga County redistricting. Uh, I think they can be brought in unless it's not their you know, editor's choice to also cover city redistricting. If there are neighborhood weeklies, and get a list of, of those papers and the TV stations. Jihan, did you ever get the list of the um, press contacts from the, the city's um, communications office? Did they ever share that list with you? Um, yeah, so I emailed it to the, the press release to the um, press at email at the mayor's office. So they said they sent it out. And yeah, I confirmed with someone there too. Can you ask them to... Can you ask them to give you the list of press contacts so okay. we don't have to use them to mail it out, but we have our own list and put it in the shared drive? Okay, sure. To that. Yeah, I mean, you need to determine who in city government you can rely on, uh, who really will care to help you, or how you should do this with the resources you have on your own. Like, Jihan, do you have the resources or availability to do a lot of this work yourself? Um, I, I'm trying to, um, like you said, I did contact like one reporter who did cover some redistricting, but still he hasn't answered. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure like if there's other ways like, you know, if you can, if you want to just email me or we can talk. Okay. Like Molly said, they're like really not reaching out or like only like one I feel has actually done, but like it seems like it's not that like interesting <laughs> to the, the press right now. Well, let's see whether the county process where that goes, whether it blows up or goes away and then determine keeping your distance from the county process, which is very highly politicized, uh, whether you know there's an opportunity there to go after the press, but any media you see on the county process uh, keep track of who the reporters are, if it's a TV station, if it's a newspaper, if it's a community paper, any reporter who's, you know, covering the county redistricting, uh, you know, ought to uh, track this as well, or at least talk to them. Uh, for some reason, I think the county legislature is meeting tomorrow on county redistricting. I'm not sure. But um, um yes, it's tomorrow at eleven thirty. And I this is Jackie. Sorry for the darkness. I'm still picking up stuff for our distribution. But um so it's tomorrow at eleven thirty. And I think yeah, a lot of people either folks are gonna be there or focus on that since the public meeting. And of course, we're still dealing with COVID and the reality that people don't necessarily want to be in these spaces and mm -hmm. places indoors. Yep. Also, there's a group in New York called uh, Fair District Central New York. Have you come across them? They usually like um, retweet our posts or like basically um, like it. They're on Twitter mostly. But are they a real organization or just someone's Twitter account? I thought they were like a real organization. <laughs> they, they, I, uh, I, I follow them on Twitter also, but we ought, we ought to get them involved. I don't know what their politics are. True. But, uh, okay. You know, I can unfollow them then because I don't want to like. Um... Yeah, I, I don't know their politics at all. Also, uh, you know, League of Women Voters, if they have a uh, chapter in Syracuse. Yeah, uh, they, they do. do. Uh, League of Women Voters is called the um, Onondaga Votes, they don't necessarily, while well, I've asked them several times, they're not going to make any public statements 
uh, because they kind of uniformly do that press release. Um, so I can ask them to be on a Zoom and then the president is shown. Yep. The, the New York State uh, League. Like the New York State League is placing a big emphasis on counting local redistricting next year. They have a new staff person who um, just joined and probably hasn't been up to speed on the county. I'll reach out to her and ask her if she could uh, develop some contacts or at least light some fires in, in Syracuse. All right, sorry, just to go back for a second. What was the name of, that you mentioned a minute ago, Jeff, that we're not sure who they are? Fair District Central New York, I think. That's the name Fair of it. Maps. Fair Maps CNY, is that? Fair, yeah, that's it. Fair Maps CNY. I thought that was affiliated with uh, Common Cause, but. I think they probably work together, but they're in, independent on paper, at least. Jeff, for our website and for our socials, um, do you have like some either copy that we can use or like some outlines of just some information to help um, when we do do these interviews or, you know, if we can get them? I mean, I'm thinking even like, even like tape recording, like, some of us talking about like why we got involved and like why this is important to us and like what are like what does community of interest mean to us like some of the educational stuff and some of the get to know you stuff interview stuff we could be doing on our social but like do you have some like um whether it's copy or just like some points of like what we should be hitting like buzzwords to be saying phrases things like that to help i could put this together for you that'd be great mm. Okay. We should also have a conversation again with Susan Lerner to get her input, her ideas. In between what, I, what, what Josh and I do, Common Cause, Women Voters, those are the big, you know, the major players in the state. And to bring in as many uh, you know, people to look at it, uh, that this is a unique process that Syracuse uh, created, a process that almost no other locality has. We'll, we'll, I'll work with you on trying to gin up uh, more attention. Jeff, now do you, do you guys have access to translation or will we have to get our own? Yeah, you'd um, have, uh, that was, uh, I meant to mention that before, uh, you'd probably at the hearings want to have translation services. Uh, that also might be where I think the New York Immigration Coalition used to have maybe still has a Syracuse staff person. Uh, they were they were helpful. The, the New York Immigration Coalition was helpful in getting the state commission to uh, have simultaneous translations. Uh, you know I did work with with New York Immigration Coalition and Onondaga County on the census back in 2018. Uh, I'll find out if they still have somebody. Do any of you know New York Immigration Coalition in Syracuse. Let me, I'll find out there as well. But New York Civil Liberties Union, uh, because they are closely monitoring and involved with the redistricting on their legal level, they have, they brought that up as well as far as any printouts or any informational for public outreach. They had access to um, the various interpreters because it may be more than Spanish, I guess we're looking at. Yeah, I know the um, New York Civil Liberties Union redistricting attorney. Uh, I'll, I'll touch base with them. I did some work for the Circus Community Health Center as a consultant, and we're looking at um, Somali, Bhutanese, other um, French Congolese, and there was one other, um, see the Arabic of Farsi, which are very similar. Those were the four main languages that we might have to worry about. And then there might be other ones as well. It was Somali, French, Congolese, Arabic. Well, French, yeah. 
Arabic, of Farsi, and then of course Spanish. Spanish. And um, we have a very large Bhutanese population as well. But I think, I don't think we had to get much translated for them. I might be, I have to pull up my, my work that I did for the Circus Community Health Center, because a lot of the um, new Americans um, come through the Syracuse Community Health Center prior to them going on, on to other for, for medical providers. So I can I have some of that background information. Okay. So Jeff, we'll have Jihan send you over what we sent out as the press release. Also, um, if you don't already have it, the link to our website and to all of our socials so you can get your very honed eyes on them. And, um, you know, just, you know, any suggestions or anything, we'd love that some um, tips or resources about like what to add, what to put in there, just even just some copy um, would be great. So we'll do, we'll send that over to you. She'll, she'll do that this week. Um, I'm wondering, is this the point we're talking about like doing educational stuff in January and January is like really, really soon. And then March will be here before we know it. Um, so I'm wondering, is this the time that we step it up with our meetings and start doing weekly? Uh, well, you, you know, a few of you volunteered for committees, maybe take through the first week of January. I'm, I'm taking it that the next week will be slow everywhere, but hit the ground running January 3rd and uh, you know, follow up with these committees on contacting the schools on the outreach and then regroup maybe the uh, second week in January and see how much progress has been made and what the need is. Uh, you know, during January, I'll be working on uh, educational materials. I think Josh will be working on some of the you know, data uh, work and we'll move this along so that we have a pretty good working platform and have all of our data and our, our ducks in order in February, as well as scheduling the hearings in early to mid, no later than early to mid February. So I, I just think that locating venues for hearings, uh, contacting the city for help with recording, uh, getting translators, there's, those are a lot of you know, time consuming efforts. Um. So March through the beginning of May, I guess that leaves us about, you know, two months for all of the public meetings. Should we be thinking like one meeting a week or should we like double up on some of those earlier ones before the first draft and then have like a week or so between so we can do the actual map stuff and then like big clusters of groups at the end or should we like space it out more evenly um, when we're thinking about making dates? Because it will be hard to reserve buildings and things like that if we don't have dates for like when these meetings yeah, should I, be. I would focus right now on trying to locate the venues to let's say have hearings. Um, you have to have how many, how many, uh, remind me, how many wards are there? Five. And you have to hold two in each ward, right? One before, one after that first draft. So we need five venues in March. We need you know, five venues after that. Uh, you should start lining them up and having the dates in March. I'll just mention the only day of the week right now I'm not available in the evening is on Wednesday. I teach on Wednesdays from six to eight. And we should probably target a date to um, regroup in uh, in January, 
uh, looking at the calendar. Um, meeting uh, January 3rd will be a big day for the state process. Uh, maybe have a meeting on the 4th or 5th report back Tuesday or, or when, well, Tuesday or Wednesday. My Wednesdays don't get busy until January 19th. So the first two weeks of January, I'm pretty flexible. Um, we've always had our meetings on Monday, so I don't know. Um, it, does everyone feel comfortable, especially if we did it on Zoom and it was just a working meeting, we wouldn't need to reserve the space at City Hall. Um, is everyone able to meet on like that Tuesday the 4th instead of Monday? Well, I'm available. Okay. Yeah, give me thumbs up, thumbs down sort of thing or type in the chat box. We could, um, Molly, we, we could even just do our regular meeting um, on Monday and then whoever can make it for the working meeting on Tuesday will be there. I, I, I don't think we should separate the two, um, especially if we're gonna, if we meet on Monday the 3rd as a commission, um, then we can get our ducks in a row and know exactly what we're going to talk about on Tuesday when we when we meet with Jeff. Is is that feasible or to everybody? Should we ask everybody? If it's available for Zoom, I'm more interested in that. How you're saying we should meet? That's all. This is Melody. John? Sorry, I didn't hear your Go question. Ahead. I'm sorry. I'm just confused on those, how you said we we're going to set that up that Monday and that Tuesday. Well, our, our regular meetings are always scheduled on the Mondays. Right. But um, then we would have our regular meeting, whether it's by Zoom or in person, um, doesn't really matter. But then we... Jason just, just said the New Year's Day is uh, being uh, uh, celebrated on that Monday. Okay, well, we can just have the meeting with, with Jeff on Tuesday, if that's okay with everybody else. That's fine with me. I was just throwing it out I, there. I am available Monday night, the 3rd. I just pointed out the 3rd is the day that the New York State Commission says they're going to be doing their plans, if they do a plan at all. So that, that won't necessarily affect an evening meeting of this group. So do we want to keep our just regular meeting schedule or change it? I'm not going to be able to make it on that Monday, but I can do that that Tuesday, the 4th. Well, maybe not. Um, yeah, I can do that Tuesday, the 4th. If it's by Zoom, it'd be easier. Um, it's going to be tough with things being closed on that Monday. I'm, I'm happy to switch the day, but I definitely would need to know now just because... Um, blocking things off in the evening I need just so I don't schedule anyone um I'm fine to do Tuesday I prefer to just do one meeting that week um and Tuesday does work for me and I would prefer zoom um with all of the spikes right now anyway right okay so I'm, I'm just following through on you Molly and I'm and you know I got your back so we're looking at zoom <laughs> on Tuesday the 4th at 5 30 I'm just voting yes, if that's what's out there. Okay, does anyone have any, like this absolutely does not work? All right, I'm gonna make an executive decision that we're going to meet that Tuesday, 5.30 to seven on Zoom, you will get your links. Um, and we'll go from there, subcommittees will continue their work independently, um, talking to each other. Um, and then hopefully we'll have more information and know what's what by January 4th. Okay.
I second, I make that motion and second it. <laughs> perfect, perfect. <laughs> okay. So do we have any other questions or concerns while, um, while we have Jeff and Joshua on the call before we take a break for the next couple weeks? I just, I just have a question. We've been mentioned a couple times about wards. There's 19 wards in Syracuse and there's five districts. So we're talking five districts, not 19 wards. Correct? Yes. Yeah, the city council districts, the districts from which the city council is elected, yeah. We're talking, we, when we're talking the five meetings, that's for the five council districts. A couple of times it's been said having meetings in the ward, and we're not, we're not going to meet in 19 different wards, we're going to meet in five council districts. That's okay. correct, yes. One, one additional question for Jeff. Um, he had said about the work involved in doing, setting up the meetings, including getting um, like translators. Is that is that any stuff that your group does or we do? You should be doing, somebody in city government probably arranges for uh, translation and recording. So we, we would wanna work with the city apparatus that does that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so to recap, um, John, Melody, and Jackie are going to be working on this committee around finding space. And you can also, because you'll be talking, you can also look at, you know, just some of the time frames because you will have to give people a loose um, idea of when we're looking to kind of get their space. Um, so those people, and if anyone else has particular interests, the few people who are not on tonight, Maybe they might want to jump on. That's cool. Um, Jihan will type up some of the bullet points here. We're gonna post, this is being recorded. We're gonna post it in the drive um, for them to watch if they're so inclined, um, but we'll put the bullet points on. So you guys will be doing the um, public meetings. Um, and as far as the public, um, press stuff. Um, John and I are actually going on Dustin Zarney's podcast in a couple of weeks. So we have that going for us. I'm not sure how many subscribers he has, but we will do that. So tune in um, and we will get Jeff just, all of our information. I just I have up. Oh, excellent. <laughs> I appeared on just on Dustin's show about a week or two ago. I I watched. Yes, it was it was okay. very good. Thank you. Okay, so we will get you, Jeff, all of like what we have so far in terms of um, socials and website, um, and then hopefully we can beef it up. And um, oh, there was the educational information. Um, I bet I will continue to talk to you about that um, and we'll partner with um, Jihan and everyone who does social and um, we'll think about some of the educational stuff. If okay, cool. and Bruce too. Oh, and Bruce, how could I forget Bruce? All right. All right, any other questions or concerns? Does everyone know kind of what we're doing, what we're working on? Well, we have the maps and overlays by next, by January 4th. The basic old ones we were talking about at the beginning. Do you, you don't have them now? Not with the, not with, not, I don't think so, not with the overlay. 
So we're, we're really at the starting point now where Josh needs to be provided with the shapefile maps. Oh yeah, yeah, no, I, I, had, I just got the link to the shapefile maps. Yeah, well, what overlays do you need? Are you, you were talking about the prisoners? Oh, you mean the demographic and deviation report? No, you won't have that by January 4th. Yeah, I'm off uh, work from the 22nd to the end of the year. Uh, so the next couple of days is just not, uh, yeah, that's not feasible. No worries. Okay. We all have our marching orders. Um, any other questions? No. Okay. All right. So if there's nothing else, Jeff or Joshua, did you have anything else for us before we meet again in January? We covered a lot of turf. Okay. So I'll just wish you all a happy holidays. Happy Merry holidays Christmas, everyone. Well. Happy holidays. Merry yes. Christmas. Yeah. Merry happy Christmas, holidays. everybody. Yes. Happy end of the semester. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy the days. 